Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for attending this webcast. This sorry, this um, the market briefing um, to from uh, Yol Development and System Plus, um, dedicated to processor, market, and technology CPU, GPU. My name is Faisal El Kamasi. I'm a global support sales and coordination manager for Yol Development, based on how application processor monitor, the aim of this, way, this live market briefing presented by John Lawrence, technology and market analysis at Yol Development, and Belinda Dude, technology and cost analysis at System Plus Consulting, is to provide you in 30 minutes uh, on the recently released processor manufactured with today's leading edge process technology to deliver exceptional performance with a focus on Apple. Before we get started, I remind you that you are encouraged to submit question to how analysts during all the web, all these live events using the ask a question windows at the bottom of the screen. Question will be answered right after the presentation. In case we don't have time to answer all of them, we will follow up by email. To conclude, this live event is recorded. You will receive tomorrow an email with the link to the access of the recorded session. So let's start the webcast. Belinda, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. I am going to be presenting to you uh, the physical characteristics that we have seen in the M1 system on chip. So Apple has actually been using a lot of processors in all their devices, moving from the iPads to the iPhones to the Apple Watch. So here, as you can see, the M1 system on chip is used in the Apple Mac mini. It's also used in the Apple MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro. This M1 chip, it actually resembles the iPad Pro uh, A12Z. So here, what we have, uh, this chip was actually specifically designed by Apple. It's in-house designed, and it was designed for only their products. So it, Apple actually outsourced this, it designed and it outsourced the manufacturing to TSMC. The architect and the configuration of this Apple M1 is not totally new. We have the DRAM memory on the side of the M1 component. So here, this is what we have. The M1 chip actually provides a faster CPU performance and also a very fast GPU performance. So with the, all this performance, we actually have up to 11 trillion operations for each second. So you can imagine the speed on how it works and transfers all this information. Here we have a CT scan. On your right, we have the 3D uh, X-ray image that we can see embedded in the PCB, in this PCB where they actually had to put uh, the Apple and the memory. We actually have the Apple M1 uh, chip. We actually have some embedded capacitors that are inside the PCB. And also we have two DRAM memories that are actually assembled on the same PCB with the M1 chip to actually increase the bandwidth. A teardown is actually performed my, by my team to actually reveal the M1 chip. Here, our aim was to look at the M1 chip precisely to see the, the die size. As you can see, the dimensions that we have given you, this is actually a very big die. So here in this die, we actually had, we had removed the metal cover that was actually protecting the M1 chip. And a thermal interface material is actually deposited on top of the chip in order to help with the heat dissipation. Since this chip is actually a system itself, we actually think that it produces so much heat that needs to be transferred and taken out of the system. 
Okay, talk about Moore's law. Moore's law has slowed down, but it is not dying. It's it has not died. When in 2020, Apple takes out their M1 chip that actually has 16 billion transistors. So they are using a five nanometer technology knot that allowed them to have up to 16 billion transistors on a single chip. So this number of transistors is very huge. It actually provides supercomputing power and reduced power consumption to all the devices that are actually going to be using this M1 chip. So this is the, oh, it's okay. So here we look at the type, type blocks. As we said, this is a system on chip. We have different blocks that are actually, uh, and different components that are actually integrated on this single die. So what do we have as the main blocks? The three main blocks that we have, we've got, we have the core GPU, we have the standard cell logic, these are the transistors, and also we have the HP, the HP computing complex. So all these actually make up more than 60% of the die area. So they are taking most of the die area in this functionality chip. As we talk about the teardown that we made, we have an image of the FinFET, as you can see there. So this is a, actually a new technology. Uh, we have so many advantages of using five nanometer technology. And also, as you use five nanometer technology, this comes down to a new technology that is being made. So there is so much investment that has to be put in to actually take to be able to actually produce five nanometer FinFET transistors. And you actually have to develop new material that you are going to use for the fabrication. And because most of the manufacturers, they do not have the experience and they have, uh, as this is new manufacturing process, they are lower yields that are going to be expected. In the previous slides, I talked about the dye being very huge. So what does this mean in the manufacturing process? The dyes, the dyes were very huge. And in our estimation, we estimate that there are less than 600 dyes per wafer. Here, we're talking about a 300 millimeter wafer. So the lower the number of dyes on your wafer, this means that they are lower devices or components that you can actually take out from a single wafer. So here with the big die, with the semiconductor manufacturing uh, technology, and the rule is the bigger the die, you are going to have less yield that you're going to have. Because just one die, if there's a problem with just one die, you are losing a lot from the wafer. So also we will go to the cost. The cost is high. So this is one due to the new technology that is being done, the investment in the equipment, and sometimes the investment in the new clean rooms that you have to use, and also the new expertise that you have to hire and the people that you have to pay. And also not forgetting the lower yields as you are starting to process this type of technology. So here you also have to concentrate and know the costs that you're looking at when we're talking about the five nanometer technology. So finally, what I would want to give you out is Apple has actually entered the processor market by designing their own chip. This is the new processor that has been designed by Apple. So what have Apple gained from this? They have gained a supply chain control. So part of the supply chain has been managed by Apple internally. So this is very good for them. And also we have to think about the five nanometer transistors that are providing the high density and the high performance. They come at a cost. The architecture and the technology, it provides the industry with very high performing, fast processing, and power saving processors that can be used in the new devices that we have in the market. But this actually has cost impact with high investments that need to be channeled for this type of technology. And also the high wafer cost 
that is being compromised by the low yields that are there for new technologies. And also, there is, it is very important for the manufacturer to constantly improve their yield and control their yield, eventually to have a cost reduction of this type of technology chip. So this is all that I had for you for today. I will leave the floor for FICA. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Belinda, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, John, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Belinda. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, yeah, so the uh, Belinda touched on the cost estimation for the M1, uh, where the blend of five nanometer FinFET and the die size bring, bring significant cost implications. Uh, in, in fact, I think we could say that the M1 is Apple's most costly processor that they've designed uh, thus far. Um, what uh, What is interesting, though, is, is that when we think about the, uh, we actually see this as a cost advantage for Apple relative to the uh, previous processors they were placing in MacBooks, uh, being an Intel uh, CPU. As uh, in, an in-house design silicon, uh, you no longer are paying, uh, Apple is no longer paying Intel margin, but yes, they have to pay TSMC margin, which is uh, maybe similar now to, to Apple mar or to Intel margin. Uh, however, at, at, in, on a front end cost manufacturing cost basis, not the fully packaged, pros, uh, packaged product basis. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, this, you know, we see this as a bill of materials uh, cost improvement for Apple. Um, not to mention the latest announcement from Apple, uh, I think in the last weeks was that the M1 would also move into iMac and MacBook Pro lines, uh, which have historically had discrete graphics card placements or discrete uh, GPU placements. Um, and will now go forward with just this the M1, uh, which is not so not only is the M1 displacing a, a prior CPU technology, but also displacing this uh, these discrete GPUs going forward. So that carries even more uh, build material cost savings implications. Uh, and this adds another layer to Apple's vote of confidence in their design prowess. And of course, that of their IP partners, namely in ARM. Um, previously, where ARM-based processors were found in laptops uh, or, or PCs in general, these were systems where mobility and battery life uh, was valued over the general compute performance capabilities of the processor. Uh, with the M1, it seems Apple is making the claim that it's no longer an either or proposition. So we may see more PC OEMs look to move ARM-based solutions into higher, uh, higher performing tiers, uh, given this uh, release from, from Apple. And speaking of ARM, NVIDIA announced their new ARM-based server CPU Grace at GTC. So too early to tell what extent of x86 market share, uh, server market share that would displace, but the value proposition is is certainly real uh, for servers using already using a GPU for acceleration. Uh, it follows, uh, it's logically sound uh, to follow that uh, NVIDIA, who has been key on accelerating AI, AI workloads, could design a, a processor that works complementary with uh, the general purpose GPU. So. Setting aside the growth in ARM-based PC processors, thanks to Apple, uh, the GPU accelerated server is the fastest growing segment we see in the compute space. Uh, so even a small foothold there uh, should make good business sense for, for NVIDIA and ARM. Uh, so taking a moment on the application processor space, the consumer-based application processor market uh, saw revenue for chip designers uh, 30, of 37 billion in 2020. Um, we expect that to grow above 40 billion in 2021 and may reach above 60 billion by 2026. This growth comes from both increasing units in segments like the, uh, the APU-based uh, laptops, as, as well as increasing in processor, processor pricing. Um, as as Belinda mentioned, you know the the in, increasing in in pricing would reflect the AP, uh, the APU's existence in the leading edge of foundry process nodes, and these leading edge nodes are becoming more and more complex to to um, to produce at shrinking lithography, and that's going to be an increase in wafer costs from foundries. 
and designers will likely pass that cost on to their customers rather than eat that uh, cost within their own uh, margin. So in this space, uh, Apple is about 20% of the smartphone market and about 40% of tablets, uh, which in fact is another model the iPad Pro is getting uh, an upgrade to the M1 uh, coming soon. So it's not only displacing uh, Intel CPUs uh, in the prior MacBook models, but it's also displacing uh, prior Apple A chips or, or AX chips or AZ chips. And how does the uh, APU based laptop processor compare to the rest of the rest of the traditional compute market? Um, so it, it's certainly small. Uh, the APU piece of this is the darkest blue uh, with the kegger of 28%. Um, it's less than 5% of, of total units today uh, in this CPU and GPU uh, view. But as you can see, it's growing at the fastest clip, mainly on the back of this strategic decision from Apple. Uh, we have it reaching almost 10% of units by 2026. And I mentioned the growth in these computing spaces. Um, here we see the revenue picture of the main pillars of compute altogether, APU, CPU, and GPU. Uh, in Yule's forecasted revenues uh, out through 2026. Here I, I would want to point out the outliers in that growth, of course, server GPU and the ARM-based PC CPU. You have some other strong growth, certainly, in uh, with server CPUs, and, and there's interesting things in, in application processors. Uh, but to focus our discussion, you can really see how placing the M1 and its successors in our model has swung the APU-based PCs from a lower-end mobility-focused notebooks into uh, capturing some uh, a significant portion of that mainstream high performing systems. And then another way to look at uh, the revenue picture is if we uh, taking a moment to, to talk about the, that server side I mentioned uh, at the beginning, the Another, another place to find big growth is looking historically as well as looking forward uh, in the server segment. So here we isolate the server CPU and GPU, put them together, and you see why NVIDIA would be looking to, to capture more of this space with their, um, with their grace announcement. So uh, their leadership in the data centers, GPU space, um, but looking to crack into the, the, G, the CPU space as well. As a whole, we see this segment uh, potentially doubling um, the, the, cap, the combined CPU and GPU uh, placement in server. Uh, we see this revenue potentially doubling by the end of uh, 2026. And then as a whole, at Yol, we, we take a holistic approach to the market model. And given our expertise in the technology side, we can translate our thoughts on uh, end system placements and, and design wins and and die size and process nodes and translate those back into uh, real wafer volumes um, in the in the fabs. And this coupling that, uh, you know, I mentioned the reason we expect APU prices to climb, and you can hold that in your mind and look at this picture and uh, and understand how we think about the the uh, future complexity of, of uh, semiconductor processes. Um, as as we see a what's a modest increase in wafers here, um, coupled with what you saw previously of, of growing revenues. Uh, really, it's it's that a wafer ran in 2024 is going to be much more expensive than a wafer ran today because in 2024 it'll be on three nanometer or uh, or a mixture of three nanometer and five nanometer. Um, or at Intel, it'll be on seven nanometer, but you know ahead of where they are today. And uh, and in 2026, the same will be true. Uh, those wafers will be even more complex and more, um, the, the processes on, on those wafers will be more complex. So, so that's, that's really what's going on. And really, so, so if, if process costs are going up and foundries want to maintain their margin um, and then designers want to maintain their margin, uh, who, who who's really winning in this in this whole uh, value chain and, and and i mean one perspective is certainly that the equipment suppliers are are 
should win. Uh, a more complex process re requires more equipment to to uh, run the the wafer. So, uh, as you see, this is and we here we're isolating uh, key foundries and uh, the main IDM uh, Intel. This is a this is a space that required maybe thirty billion dollars of annual cap capital expenditure uh, as recently as just three or four years ago. Uh, looking ahead in this year and, and then for the next few years to come, this is a space that we think uh, should have uh, close to sixty billion dollars worth of, of capital expenditure, uh, and that's what that is what will enable the the kinds of volumes on five nanometer and beyond that that Apple needs that uh, everyone else in the uh, SOC designing space will need and as well as in the the uh, fabulous and IDM uh, design space. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for your presentation. Uh, it's time now for the Q&A session. We received quite a lot of questions today. Uh, let's try to answer them. So first question, maybe for you, John, um, how is Apple able to manage this uh, processor change? And would other OEMs be capable of a similar move? Mm. So Apple has a few advantages here that's uh, playing in their favor that uh, other OEMs may not be able to replicate, at least not near term. Uh, Apple is certainly fully capable of designing their own processors for a long time with the all of the iPhone chips and the iPad chips and Apple Watch chips. Um, they, they have a, a, a highly capable team uh, behind all of that. Uh, the other advantage for Apple there already is that they have complete control over their their hardware and software environment. Um, they don't, uh, there's no other uh, devices out there running in an Apple OS that isn't an Apple, a piece of Apple hardware. So, so given that amount of control, they're able to um, tailor the the experience uh, and, and have you know, much cleaner uh, interplay between the hardware and software. And, and so the M1, when it was released, also came out with a, a, a brand new Apple operating system that was meant to uh, complement that. So, so that sort of activity would be harder for someone, for a, a Windows-based OEM to, to enable, even or even a, a yeah, Windows-based OEM to enable because uh, even or even if you're Microsoft, you know, putting out a you know, Surface uh, laptop, um, the the operation system you're running is also running on on so many other uh, devices in the ecosystem that you don't have control over or you don't have clear control over, and that's um, that will you know makes things a lot much more complicated to integrate in between the software and hardware side. Okay, thank you. Yeah, very clear. Thank you. Uh, a question for you, Belinda. From the uh, package X-ray image, it shows uh, some embedded capacitors. How many capacitors are embedded and how are they placed in relation to the M1 die? Oh, yes, That's indeed. It. There were six capacitors. You are right. There were capacitors that are embedded inside the PCB, there were six capacitors that are directly under the M1 chip. So you had uh, two of the capacitors that were under the big core, and you have one capacitor under the GPU, one capacitor under the CPU, and another one under the NPU, and the last one was under the logic cells. This is the standard cell. So these are the six capacitors that were directly placed in position in relation to the M1 chip. Okay, six capacitors. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. That. John, a question for you. How much of the data center CPU market is addressable by NVIDIA Grace and its successors? Yeah, uh, fair question. The, so NVIDIA pitched Grace as a, um, as a processor uh, architecture that would that would uh, combine or integrate with an NVIDIA 
GPU uh, or, or data center GPU. So, so as if we follow that um, that paradigm, then the the amount of servers that are um, that are using GPUs for uh, for acceleration or, or coprocessor acceleration that would those are the ones that maybe are the the, the lowest hanging fruit so to speak on on that so so today that's less than ten percent of the overall server space um, but going out that that's also the the, the fastest growing and, and the the most uh, interesting from from AI workload standpoint and machine learning um, and, and so we could see that that percent certainly doubling over, over the next few years um, whether or not uh, data centers and hyperscalers choose to uh, integrate to that solution versus sticking with the x86 based CPU that's still yet I think as I mentioned it's it's still too early to tell but that's that's the order of magnitude we're talking about in the server space of, of right now it's it's less than 10 percent and it, you know it could get to you know mid-teens or, or even 20 percent by uh, four or five years from now thank you thank you John thank you uh, Belinda uh, one question yeah. for you which other players have processor using five nanometer process in the market? Uh, could you comment on their on their gate pitch? Okay, uh, very good question. When you talk of the five nanometer that is so hot in the market right now, uh, we're looking at uh, the M Apple M1 first of all. So this one was actually manufactured by TSMC. And then we also have Samsung that has come in in 2020 with their um, manufacturing. Samsung, uh, there is Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 that is actually manufactured by Samsung. And also we, Samsung has their own five nanometer chip that is out in the market, Equinox 21100. And also we're going to have an analysis, a physical analysis of this and the cost estimation that is going to be coming out later for the reports uh, from System Plus. Uh, so what I can actually comment for you on uh, the fin pitch and the gate pitch. Usually for the five nanometer that we have uh, looked at, the ones that we have done, we see that we have a gate pitch of about 49 up to 50 nanometers. And also the fin pitch is about 30 nanometers. So this is the estimate that I can give you for this, for this um, five nanometer technology. Okay, very clear. And maybe um, uh, another question for you, a last question. Um, oh. How much area on the M1 die is occupied by the standard cell logic? Okay, yes, I get a lot of that question. Uh, on this chip, when we're talking about the M1 chip, as we saw that um, the chip is actually a system itself, but the bigger part is actually being occupied by the standard cells. These are the logic cells. So on the chip that we actually saw, we estimated about 28% to 30% of the die area was actually occupied by these transistors, the logic cells. Okay. Very clear. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. The, the live uh, market briefing is now ending. Sorry, we, we receive a lot of questions, but we will try to answer by email uh, as soon as we can. So thank you. Thank you again, Belinda. Thank you, John, for your time and analysis. Uh, to, to everyone, uh, you will soon receive an email with the link to the presentation within thir 34 hours. Um, feel free to, to, to share the presentation with colleagues. Finally, please let me remind you that you can find all our reports, tracks, and monitors on our website, uh, www.i-micronews.com. Uh, do not hesitate to contact us if you have additional questions. You can find our contact details on the last slide of the presentation. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a good day and take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.